So we're here in the Silicon Valley. I know this is the birth of great ideas. And I hope that my talk here will help all of you in the audience to realize how to bring your fantastic ideas for new devices to the US market in the most expeditious manner. I'm sure all of you know that you do have to deal with the FDA in order to make your idea <laughs> into a reality because we do oversee all of the drugs, biologics, medical devices, in addition to food and cosmetics. All of the medical products can be broken down into four big groups, biologics, drugs, device, combination products. And at the very in incept of your idea, it is imperative for you to try to figure out what is the end product going to be considered in the United States. And I emphasize in the United States because regulatory definitions are different among different countries. So in the US, biological product means any virus, therapeutic serum, toxin, antitoxin, or analogous product applicable to the prevention, treatment, or cure of diseases or injuries of man. While drug is an article recognized in US pharmacopoeia that is intended for use in the diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease in men or other animals. And it's those, those articles that are intended to affect the structure or any function of the body of men or other animals. Finally, devices, which is obviously my passion. Device is anything that diagnoses, cures, mitigates, treats, or prevents disease or condition, or affects the functional structure of the body, and this is the caveat, does not achieve its intended use through chemical action and is not metabolized. And those last two bullets would usually make a clear distinction between drug and end device. If you think of FDA as a humongous organization, you're absolutely right, but within the FDA there are six centers uh, Center for Food Safety, Center for Drug Evaluation, Center for Biologics, Center for Devices, and Center for Veterinary Medicine, and National Center for Toxicological Research. And just as a tangent, I see several of you taking notes. I believe all of these slides will be available on the website, and I have designed the slide deck with all of the links to pertinent websites so that nobody has to take notes. Now, what is a combination product? combination of two or more different types of products. So the drug and a device, a device and a biologic, drug and a biologic, drug and device and biologic. And I do want to spend a minute emphasizing this because we see this as a new emerging area. There are more and more combination products uh, coming to the FDA every day. Regulatory approaches differ greatly between biologic drugs and devices, and the combination products are just as the name implies, are a combination of the respective regulatory approaches. Office of the Combination Products, which is not in any one center, but is actually under the Office of the Commissioner, is charged with assigning FDA center to have the primary jurisdiction for review of both the combination and single entity products, where the jurisdiction is unclear or in dispute. It provides a focal point for combination product issues for both internal and external stakeholders, and has a broad oversight responsibility covering the regulatory life cycle of combination products. Or simply, it answers four questions that the products may ask if they could talk. What am I? Classification. Where do I go? Assignment. What do I do when I get there? Regulatory pathway. And how can I get out of there as quickly as possible? <laughs> Now, product determination, or RFD, is a venue via which you can get Office of Combination Product to give you a very prompt response on all of these four questions. And the link, just as I said, to the RFD is on this slide. Many people ask me, well, when should I submit RFD? When is it too early? When is it too late? I always recommend submitting an RFD before any submission. 
Why? Because we, will stop, we may stop the review clock while a determination is being made. So if you're thinking that you're going to submit an RFD and simultaneously submit a marketing application, uh, your timing for your project is going to be way off. I like to think of the total life cycle of the medical devices. And I think this diagram is a simple representation from uh, discovery and ideation all the way to post-market. So as w during this talk, we're going to move through the cycle. And I will m give my five cents of what I recommend along the whole pathway. So when you're first in the stage of discovery and ideation, you need to learn. You need to learn as much as you can. You need to make sure that you don't solely rely on the consultants who will assure you that they know everything there is to know about FDA. They will assure you that they know the latest and the greatest. And many of them are very good. However, we cannot regulate the consultants. We cannot tell you who is good and who isn't good. So I always recommend for anybody who is interested in getting the product to the market, actually spend a little time and learn. Learn on your own so you can have the basic understanding. And in order to help people like you with great ideas, we created this new tool. And it's actually called CDRH Learn. And again, the link is at the bottom. It's an innovative educational tool which consists of learning modules describing many aspects of medical device regulations. And it is intended to provide industry with information that is comprehensive, interactive, and easily accessible. It has many formats, including videos, audio recordings, and slide presentations, and is really very easy to navigate. I won't say the whole FDA website is easy, but this is very, very easy to navigate. Now, let's assume that you, are, you have uh, done your due diligence, you have gone through CDRH Learn, and now you are convinced that you do have an idea for a product that will be considered a device. Well, if that's the case, then you will be dealing with us, Center for Devices and Radiological Health, or CDRH. And we're in charge of all of the devices. As you can see on the slide, anything from the Band-Aid to a heart valve falls within our scope. We obviously do not have the same regulatory approach to all of the devices, as their risk is quite different. And we're very fortunate that, unlike drugs, the law gives us the flexibility to calibrate our regulatory approach to the level of potential risk posed by new products. All of the devices are classified into three classes, from class one being the simplest, lowest risk, to class three being most complex and highest risk. For class one, only general controls are needed, things like good manufacturing practices, registration, and listing. For class two, in addition to general controls, special controls are needed, and these are standards, guidance, etc. For class three, in addition to general controls, PMA is needed, which is pre-market approval. And this class of devices is reserved for those that support and sustain human life or have substantial importance in preventing health impairment or potential unreasonable risk of illness or injury. Just to put it in perspective, I put on a slide here examples from various different disciplines of class one, class two, and class three devices. So something like a surgeon's glove or a tuning fork or an elastic bandage would be considered class one. Uh, for class two, you can think of a biofeedback device or fetal blood sampler as an example. Class three would be something like an intraocular lens or auditory brainstem implant or an implantable pacemaker pulse generator. And I think this is, uh, I try to pick very common devices so that everybody gets a feel for what we're talking about. Now, if you have a new device, you've now determined that it is indeed the device, the next step is for you definitely to figure out which classification your device falls into. And the link on the, t on the first bullet will let you do that. So if, there is a t if, the, if that type of device was ever classified, it, you will find it on this link. 
Now, if you go there and you say, I have no idea where my device falls, I have looked, I have t spent the time, I have looked, and there is nothing on there that looks in any way similar to the type of device I, I envision, then you can submit something called 513G. And this is a means for obtaining our views about the classification or regulatory requirements that may be applicable to your particular device. And again, the link is on the, side, on the slide as to how you would obtain a 513G. Once you have your basic knowledge, you proceed to invention and prototype. And before you start your preclinical work, I strongly recommend a lot more digging and a lot more learning. One of the things that you need to check is guidance. We have many, many guidance on our website. Guidance describes FDA's interpretation of or policy on a regulatory issue, including what type of submission, labeling, manufacturing. In addition, many guidance also provide uh, our recommendation for clinical study conduct. Um, whether a guidance is available or not is very easy to check on the link at the bottom of this slide. Now, if you think of guidances and standards, which I will be describing in a minute, the way we talk about it is whether they are horizontal or vertical. So horizontal guidance would describe things that are applicable across different types of devices. And then a vertical guidance means that it's a guidance for a specific type of a device. So if you're looking for a vertical guidance, or you can go to the link on the slide before and put the category of device. So for example, if you put neurology, uh, these will pop up, uh, which are three guidances specific to neurological devices. Now, in addition to uh, guidance for well-established technologies, within the last two years, we have introduced a new concept, something called leapfrog guidance. And this is a mechanism via which we can share our initial thoughts regarding the content of pre-market submissions for emerging technologies. It is intended to speed the development and approval of future submissions and to expedite innovation in the United States. Uh, the two examples that uh, I give on the slides are the retinal prosthesis and the mix guidance, which was created with a great help of American Glaucoma Society under Kuldev's leadership. In addition to guidance, you need to check if there are any recognized standards that are applicable to your particular device. So the important word in this is recognized. There are standards and then there are those that are recognized by FDA and then they start being called recognized standards. A consensus standard which FDA has recognized for use in satisfying a pre-market submission requirement is called a recognized standard. And to check the recognized standards, again, the link is provided on the slide. And those outline parameters needed for evaluation of a specific device preclinical testing needed prior to human testing, and very often recommended clinical trial. It's really essential that you check this before you pursue the next steps. And again, if you go into that link and put in ophthalmics, you can scroll and um, go by American versus international, and if you put in American re uh, recognized standards for ophthalmic devices, these will pop up. And then if you put in the international standards for ophthalmic um, devices, the following will pop up. And again, it's a tremendous resource that we hope every single person will explore before they proceed to the preclinical testing because preclinical sections are always addressed in the standards. Some standards, depending on the subspecialty, don't talk about the clinical trial design. For example, in ophthalmology, they always do, but in some other areas, they might not. However, preclinical testing is always described in the standard if standard exists, and that's why I strongly recommend you look at it and search for one that's relevant before you start your preclinical testing. 
Okay, so you have done all of the reading, you have conducted your preclinical testing, everything looks great, and now you're ready to start thinking about the clinical. If what you've learned from everything you read said that FDA will require a clinical study for your device. If you are going to be conducting um, a clinical study on an unapproved device in the United States, you need to know about investigational device exemption, or an IDE. <clears throat> this is the vehicle which allows you to conduct such a study. There is a requirement for informed consent, labeling, monitoring, etc. Most important uh, for you as a leader of the company is to understand that there are two kinds of IDEs, significant risk and non-significant risk IDEs. All IDs require approval by institutional review board, but only significant risk device IDEs require approval by the FDA. And those that do have a 30-day review period, i.e. every single ID that comes into the division gets our decision within 30 days, because if they don't, they're automatically deemed approved. Again, significant risk study cannot begin until IDE is approved by the FDA. Definition of a significant risk study is one that presents a potential for serious risk to the health, self, safety, and welfare of a subject, and usually is an implant or used in supporting or sustaining human life, or of substantial importance in diagnosing, curing, mitigating, or treating disease, or otherwise poses a significant risk. Usually the sponsor makes the initial risk determination, then IRB reviews the sponsor's determination. If the IRB disagrees with the sponsor's non-significant risk assessment, IRB then must inform the clinical investigator and where appropriate the sponsor. When somebody isn't clear about whether it is or it isn't significant risk, we are available to help in making that risk determination. Um, and that can occur via Q submission. FDA is a final arbiter um, on whether something is or isn't a significant risk. With our 2014 and 2015 strategic priority clearly delineated our commitment to improve the efficiency, consistency, and predictability of the IDE process to reduce the number and time uh, needed to reach appropriate IDE full approval for medical devices, to strike the right balance between everything that's needed. Thus, the center has gone through quite a number of efforts in order to bring the clinical trial submissions to an appropriate approval state more quickly. We established a clinical trials program and a clinical trials director. We established specific SOPs for the clinical trials director involvement and review of certain ID decisions. The focus is on ensuring that we are in the right place ensuring flexibility is applied where appropriate, and increasing communication with the sponsors. Overall, we wanted to ensure that sponsors are fully informed of our expectations. Uh, and we have two vehicles, pre-submissions, which I will address in a few minutes, and we also published an IDE decisions guidance. And again, the link is provided below, so if you are contemplating conducting an ID, I strongly recommend you reading this guidance. Our efforts have really had a tremendous impact. If, here I have graphed F, FY means fiscal year, for those of you who don't usually work with the government, fiscal year 11 versus fiscal year 14. And this is a percent of IDEs that were fully approved within two cycles. And you can see a tremendous a rise from 15% to 63%. While the median days to the full study, ID study approval has drastically decreased from 442 in FY11 to 30 in FY15. 
And I'm sure with this audience, numbers do more <laughs> than my words. Now, our vision is to make sure that patients in the US have access to high quality, safe and effective medical devices first in the world. And that the US remains the world's leader in regulatory science, medical device innovation, and manufacturing. With that in mind, we have come up with a brand new program called Early Feasibility Study Program. The intent of this program is to facilitate the clinical evaluation of medical devices in the US under the ID regulation. The unique aspects of this program is that it's only applicable to clinical trials with small number of subjects, devices that may be very early in the development, typically before the device design has been finalized, and usually the first clinical use of the device for the proposed indication for use. The we have issued the guidance. Once again, the link is here, and I strongly recommend you to take a look at it. The key unique principle about this program is that an approval of an early feasibility study IDE may be based on less non-clinical data that would be needed to support the initiation of a larger clinical study on a more final device design. We're incredibly committed to this program at the center to the point where each division has now dedicated two of their reviewers to be EFS leads. In my division, which is a DOED, in addition to that, I have established an email address that's on this box, on this slide. Um, and that email address is being monitored by those two individuals. So if you ever have a question about either ophthalmic or ENT device and whether it fits into this study program, early feasibility study program, you just need to email this address and within two business days, you will get a response with the guidance and all the links that we recommend for you to read um, and uh, recommendations for the next steps. And those individuals are there essentially to hold your hand because the program usually involves small startups, just like probably many of you in this room. It is intended to help uh, people who want to bring the first clinical studies back in the US. We want to make sure that if you have a great new device of significant impact, that the very first clinical trials do happen in the US. And we will hold your hand. We will make sure we answer all your questions. We will work with you to make it happen. After you have conducted your clinical study, and you have hopefully a good data set, you need to figure out which regulatory um, submission you need to put forward. In devices, there are four types of submissions. The three of them are the standard pre-market applications for devices, which are 510Ks for class two devices, PMAs for class three devices, and HDEs for devices for small populations. 510K is a marketing clearance application, and it allows FDA determination of substantial equivalence to a predicate device, which is currently on the US market. The official definition of substantial equivalence is on the slide. It's basically if in comparison to a legally marketed device, it has the same intended use and has the same technological characteristics as a predicate, or has the same intended use and different technological characteristics, but does not raise new questions of safety and effectiveness and demonstrates it is as safe and effective as a predicate. We have worked diligently to make the submission of 510Ks um, as transparent as possible. To that end, we have a very long list of guidances uh, about 510K process. I have tried to highlight some of the key ones on these slides. 
um, and again, I will probably spare you the pain of going through each one of these. But as you can see, there's something called how to prepare traditional 510K. So no, you don't need a consultant. You can just read it. And it's, it's really, we have a whole group of people who are sure that things are written in plain language. So after we're done with it, it goes to this group to make sure they translate it to a different language that everybody can understand. So by the time the guidances get out, anybody in this room should be able to read it and clearly understand what it says. Um, we have frequently asked questions on the new 510K paradigm. We have the 510K program evaluating substantial equivalence, etc. We have done, once again, a lot of work to make sure that we stay on track to meet our performance goals related to 510Ks and other device approvals. We are very Delighted, we're delighted that the backlogs of the 510K submissions have gone down significantly and that there's a quite an impressive increase in percentage of applications that are approved or cleared. Here I have graphed the average time to decisions for 510Ks. And as you can see, while in 2010 there was a peak, since then uh, the total time to decision has gone steadily down. While the percent of the 510Ks determined to be substantially equivalent is undergoing an uptick. And we, we'd like to believe that it's due to all the new guidance and the transparent communications that we've had and all of our efforts, but who knows. <laughs> Um, just to put it in perspective, I just looked at 510Ks for ophthalmic devices only. And um, for that small subgroup, the number of annual submissions increased 75% between uh, fiscal year 9 and fiscal year 14, while we still were able to decrease the total time by 32%. And the percentage of decisions which were issued within 90 days, which is our statutory goal, has improved by 27%, uh, which surpassed all of our performance goals that we have made commitments to. Now that we discussed 510K, let's talk a little bit about PMA. Pre-market approval, as I said, uh, intended for class three devices. And the application needs to contain sufficient valid scientific evidence to provide reasonable assurance that the device is safe and effective for its intended use. When we make that determination, we consider the intended population, the conditions of use for the device, the probable benefit to health versus probable injury or illness, reliability of the device. And once again, we make a decision only based on valid scientific evidence. Every PMA undergoes a thorough review by many, many reviewers of pertinent uh, backgrounds. We look at manufacturing, biocompatibility, toxicology, engineering, sterility, shelf life, clinical labeling, and we have a separate group that looks at the post-approval study proposals. Um, and for those of you who wonder what happens to the PMA when it gets into the door of FDA, uh, a team leader is assigned and very quickly has to decide on what subspecialists are needed for review of that particular submission. And then a team is formed and each team member uh, reviews their pertinent uh, point. And then there is uh, the team leader puts together the overall assessment and everybody's recommendations. Um, and then that goes up the management chain uh, and the decision is made prior to obviously leaving the FDA based on everybody's input. For PMA review, uh, there are many stages. There's acceptance filing. Um, interactive review is something that is a relatively new feature. Uh, and <laughs> sometimes uh, really astonishes the sponsors because 
uh, yes, you might get a call from the government. I, I strongly believe that the fastest way to get answers to very quick, simple questions is to pick up the phone. And I encourage my reviewers to pick up the phone and call the sponsor if it's, a simple, if it's something that can be simply clarified rather than stopping the clock and uh, going through the whole generation of leather going up the chain, coming back down. So yes, very often you will get a call and saying on page 355 you said X, but on page 475 you say Y about the same thing, which one is correct? You know, something simple like that or please send me an email clarifying which test you have performed and which standard you think you're following. So simple things like this we try to do uh, via interactive review, and that has really significantly de decreased our overall review clock, as you can imagine. For PMAs, there are two kinds of meetings. There's a day 100 meeting, which is a standard meeting um, to give a feedback to the sponsor about, the process, uh, about where we are, where we're at at that point. And then for some PMAs, for the first of a kind applications, there is a panel meeting. Uh, where we bring the data and the questions that we have about the results of the study to a panel of experts. And we're very fortunate that many Stanford uh, um, academic, uh, academicians, including Dr. Singh, is part of our um, standing board for special government employees. And it's their wisdom that we tap when we make the decisions on these major first-of-a-kind devices. At the end of our review, there are obviously th there are three kinds of letters that we generate, either approval, which is something that everybody wants, <laughs> or approvable pending um, GMP or with deficiencies or not approvable. And just like, PM, uh, just like 510K, there are many guidance that, that address different aspects of the PMA process. The one that's uh, most recent kid on the block, the one that I believe everybody who is interested in bringing a PMA to the market needs to read is the first one. Um, and that's our benefit risk determination guidance. This is the first and only guidance anywhere in the world where a regulatory agency actually clearly states what it is that we consider when we make the risk benefit determinations and how it is that we decide what gets approved and what doesn't. The same guidance is intended to be followed by FDA <laughs> reviewers. So it is not as if we're telling the outside world something different than what we're doing inside. It clearly, the intent was to put on paper how we do what we do so that we can educate our new reviewers who we continuously hire, as well as we can clearly communicate this to the sponsors, to the individuals interested in bringing devices to the US market. And then there are many others. I just put some of the key ones on the slide. This is not an all exhaustive list. If you're interested, again, in all of the guidance, you have to go back to the links that takes you to all of the guidance and type in PMA and the comprehensive list will pop up. But these are some of the ones which I thought everybody should take a look at. And then there's are some more. <laughs> <laughs> so with all of these guidance and all of these efforts, we're delighted to see that uh, our efforts are paying off. Just like with the 510Ks, the average time to decisions for PMAs is decreasing. If you compare the total time in 2014 to uh, what we were doing, how we were performing in 2007, you can see that we're steadily decreasing. While the percent of PMAs approved has been steadily increasing. So if you compare to 2010, which was the low, to where we are in 2015. Now again, it's only, it's not a full 2015, but the data that we had at the time of generating the slide, 100% of the PMAs were approved. Now I'd like to mention HDE. And humanitarian device exemption um, 
or HDE. It is intended for disease conditions affecting less than 4,000 individuals in the U.S. per year. The HDE, unlike the PMA, uh, must show that it doesn't pose unreasonable risk of illness or injury and that it has probable benefit, which is a much lower bar than what's needed for the PMA. HDE approval authorizes marketing of a uh, HUD device. Now, in order to be eligible for an HDE, one must first obtain a HUD designation or humanitarian use device designation. And the way that's done is there's a separate group to whom the sponsor submits the proposed indication for use and tries to make a case uh, based on literature and any other available data to show that uh, the, it is in, indeed less than four, th this IFU, this indication for use, indeed affects less than 4,000 individuals per in the U.S. The other eligibility requirement is that there is no comparable device currently available on the U.S. market through the 510K or PMA. The limitation of this is that the IRB approval is required before the device is used and that labeling must clearly identify devices as a HUD and that effectiveness for that indication hasn't been demonstrated. Now, with all of this, I still believe that an HDE is a very underutilized tool. There are many devices uh, that one can envision putting through the system that are intended for very small uh, patient groups. People ask, has it ever been utilized? Yes. And the Argus II retinal prosthesis system is one of the recent examples. It did go through the HDE. As you can imagine, it was a very small population. And it is currently on the market. Now, if you know that you need to put together either PMA, an HDE, or 510K, before you do that, I strongly recommend you tap onto one of these links. And what this is, is either PMA, summaries of either PMAs, HDEs, or 510Ks for all of the devices that are on the market today. So it is very, very easy for you to see what your predecessors put together and what data they put together in order to get approval, in order to get to the market. And this is an incredibly underutilized tool. If you want to see what we've done before, you, you literally just need to click on one of these links and you will get a very thorough summary that again is written in plain language that will tell you what data and what follow-up or how the trial was designed, etc. The fourth way to get um, a class two or class three device to the market is this de novo classification process. This is something that, again, is quite underutilized. However, unlike HDE, is getting an incredible uptick within the last two years. This was established in 1997 and provided regulatory authority for FDA to classify devices that were automatically classified into class three to class one or two, uh, but excluded devices already classified into class three. Now, this all so sounds probably like jumbo mumbo, but in 2012, this rule was modified and hence the uptick. In 2012, we had Fadasia, which streamlined streamlined and increased the efficiencies for de novos. It now removed the requirement for sponsor to submit 510K prior to submission of the de novo request and created two pathways for the de novo submission. Post receipt of non-significant, of NSC, not substantial equivalents, or a direct de novo. And it also told us that we now needed to review it um, 120 days. So essentially, a de novo establishes a new device type along with classification regulation product code. And device is eligible to serve as a predicate once it's on the market for the new medical devices. 
What really changed the paradigm is our guidance, the link to which is at the bottom, which we published in 2014. This is, uh, and hence the uptick since 2014. We, the guidance clearly says that we now removed requirements for 510K submission prior to de novo, that FDA has 120 days to make the classification decision, that we can either grant or decline it, that there is a pre-submission meeting process, and that and a new term was coined, direct de novo, i.e. that you don't have to first come in with a 510K, get a non-substantial equivalence determination before requesting a de novo. Um, and as a result, once again, I'm putting the numbers where my <laughs> words are, instead of my using numbers instead of just words. If you look at the orange bar, uh, you can see that while we had none in 2010, there's quite a significant number of direct de novos in 2014. In my division alone, while about four years ago we would get one de novo every year or two, we currently have around 27 de novos in house. So some of the recent examples from my division, here's some from the ENT world, and then here's some from the ophthalmology world. Just a couple of months ago, in April of this year, we have, put to, we have published a very important guidance delineating a new expedited access program. And this allows for expedited access for pre-market approval and de novo medical devices intended for unmet medical need for life-threatening or irreversibly debilitating diseases or conditions. The goal of this brand new program is help get patients more timely access to medical devices that address unmet medical need. Essentially, this is our statement that we agree that in some cases, patients may be willing to assume greater risk for earlier access to medical devices and to reduce pre-market data requirement while increasing post-market requirements when appropriate can assist FDA in making devices available to patients sooner. Under this program, we will provide more interactive communications during device development and more interactive ID review. We will work incredibly interactively with a sponsor to create something called a data development plan which will be an outline of all data that sponsor intends to collect in support of device approval, including what data will be collected pre-market and how much of the data can be collected post-market. Okay, you have now successfully gone from discovery to preclinical to clinical to submission <coughs> to product launch. Now, you are all in the post-market, are you done? Well, um, we are involved in the total product life cycle. Um, and in the last year and a half to two years, uh, my, our center has spent a significant amount of time and resources trying to figure out if there is a shift, if we can shift how much we need pre-market to post-market, and we call this the pre-market to post-market. And once again, the final guidance just issued again just a couple of months ago. Um, the link, once again, is on the slide. Uh, the name of the guidance says it all. It's Balancing Pre-Market and Post-Market Data Collection for Devices Subject to Pre-Market appro Approval. It clarifies our policies on balancing pre and post, and an issue to facilitate patient access to safe and effective medical devices without under, undermining patient safety. It describes where it may be appropriate to issue post-approval studies at the time of the PMA approval. In addition to this guidance, 
within the last two years, uh, every single division within every division within the Office of Device Evaluation has undergone uh, an extensive process of retrospective review of our PMA device types. We, the goal is to determine whether or not to shift some of the pre-market data requirements to the post-market setting or to down-classify device types in light of our current understanding of the technology. So what does that mean? There are many PMA type devices that were deemed to be appropriate for PMA 20 years ago. Uh, what we're doing now is we're looking at each one and trying to reassess, is the regulatory paradigm still appropriate considering what we know about the devices today versus when we first put together the regulatory pathways. By last December, we have reviewed 50%. And by this December, we're going to complete the review of all the PMA type devices. And as a result, there's going to be a, a communication posted on our website with the paradigm shifts for each device that is either down classified or stratis stratified, or if there's a new uh, pathway that we have clearly, that we decided to recommend in light of the current knowledge. So there's a lot to learn, there's a lot to know. When is it appropriate to come talk to us? I thought the graphic representation would be hopefully the most clear uh, <laughs> way to communicate my opinion. Come talk to us early, come talk to us frequently, come talk to us at every single stage of the development. We're there to help innovators like you bring the devices to market. We're there to help, unlike common belief. <laughs> we have something called a pre-submission program. And again, the link is at the bottom. And that facilitates device development innovation by, pro by providing our feedback on the proposed preclinical, clinical uh, studies on the proposed indication for use. It also provides an opportunity for a meeting with the FDA. So there are several types of meetings and interactions, which I tried to summarize on the slide. But the important thing is that you need to think about the pre-submission at every point of your development. Obviously, it's voluntary, but I would like to strongly encourage all of you to consider it. Prior to initiation of the long-term preclinical study, when planning a study that doesn't require an IDE, because there are very often people will decide that to conduct a study totally outside of the US, which will not fall within the IDE reg, but then try to utilize that data to eventually come for marketing in the US. Even if you're, even if you're contemplating that approach, it behooves you to come and ask us, what do we think about your study plan? Are we going to accept that type of a data from the US, from OUS, or are there some things you need to consider? Uh, obviously, before submission of an IDE to discuss non-clinical and clinical trial study designs, before submission of a marketing application to tell us what what it is that you're planning to do and to obtain feedback on the best way to present that data, uh, gain insight into the potential hurdles for approval or clearance, and hopefully incorporate our recommendations into your submissions. And when preparing a submission for a new device that doesn't clearly fall within an established regulatory pathway, because even if you do all of the reading, sometimes you hit the gray area and it's not quite clear. Your pre-submission process is there, come ask, we will tell you our best advice. Uh, we will give you the feedback and we intend to stand behind our feedback. Precep is intended to be specific on the questions posed. However, if other deficiencies or concerns are noted, we will usually provide those to you. Um, we have a lot of institutional knowledge, and while we can't share uh, the specifics of your competitors, 
we will share in general uh, lessons learned from their mistakes that our, my, that our reviewers have learned. So if you're going down the path that we have seen four other companies previously go and fail, even if you're not asking us about it, chances are we're going to tell you something general as in when you're going down this path, we strongly recommend that you consider A, B, and C before you complete your preclinical study Z. And um, we often get a lot of raised eyebrows, but just know that the reason we're telling you this is not because we like to get you to run extra studies or do extra work. It's usually because we've seen others fail or make mistakes when they have followed the same path. Now, another mistake that many people do, you get one hour when you come in for an in-person meeting. What I would like for all of you to know is that before each meeting, there is a pre-submission for which there's a whole team that reviews the information in that pre-submission, answers the questions. Then there's a meeting with a first level manager to go over that. Then there's a usually meeting with a division director like me to summarize what was the key issues and what are our key responses and if there's anything novel that raises new issues. So by the time the meeting happens, every single FDA person in the room is well aware of your device design, of what it is you want to do, of your clinical study, and your questions. So if you have one hour, I would suggest that you use it to ask us questions and get feedback. I see the most common mistake I see is for a new company to come in for that meeting and spend 45 minutes explaining to us, it's your meeting, so we, can't, we normally won't interrupt. I might politely suggest that you move on, but I see 45 minutes somebody telling us what you know, we've been briefed on at all different levels before, and then by the time you get to your questions, you have five minutes to get an answer. It's really not a very good use of your time, of your money for the airfare, etc. We will listen, but unfortunately, we will leave after an hour because in any one day, I can have 16 to 20 meetings, depending on whether they're industry or not, because our internal meetings are half hour. Now, meetings with industry are one hour, so we have to get up and go to the next meeting because somebody else is waiting for us. So just know that by the time you walk into the room, it's your hour and use it wisely. So in summary, just everything I said can really boil down to three bullets. Apply all of the device-specific FDA resources. Utilize all of our recent pre-market program improvements. Ask for our input early in the development and what's not on the slide, actually try to implement our input before you <laughs> submit the pre-submission application. Thank you.